Hello again, folks, and thank you for being part of Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm your host, Ryan Robertson. We have a stacked show on deck for you this week. We talked to a former Navy officer turned spy, turned foreign affairs expert, Dr. Peter Brooks. I had the chance to catch up with the good doctor and get his thoughts on Iran's nuclear weapon ambitions. Uh, spoiler alert, they aren't good. Also, our weapon of the week is a wee bit wily. Uh, we're talking the new Coyote anti-drone interceptors. And there's good news about Guyana. So, a lot to get to, but first, let's take a look at some stories that you might have missed. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky used the stage at the World Economic Forum's meeting in Davos, Switzerland, to remind folks, Ukraine's war against a Russian invasion isn't just about the former Soviet bloc nations. Striking a motivated tone, President Zelensky took to the podium and laid it out. He thinks a failure to stop Russian President Vladimir Putin's designs on Ukraine would ultimately spell trouble for the other nations within Putin's reach. If anyone thinks this is only about us, this is only about Ukraine, they are fundamentally mistaken. The State Department says Zelensky also met with Secretary of State Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan about renewing the U.S.'s economic backing for the war, as well as supporting anti-corruption reform efforts within Ukraine. And you know those Javelin anti-tank missiles Ukraine is using to decimate Russian tanks and armor? Well, sounds like Kosovo wants some too, but Serbia, Kosovo's neighbor to the northeast and chief rival doesn't like the plan one bit. Needless to say, the request from Kosovo to buy javelins from the United States is being met with a less than enthusiastic response. Kosovo, which declared its independence from Serbia in 2008, gained approval from the State Department to buy 246 missiles for $75 million, a development the Serbian president called a deep disappointment. The pending purchase comes on the heels of several Serbian troop movements on Kosovo's border, actions deemed by the West as hostile. It's probably worth noting out here, Serbia is backed by Russia. The naval aviators, airmen, and marines who maintain and fly the F-35 Lightning have a problem. To truncate a phrase from famed acting coach Konstantin Stanislavski, there are no small parts. During recent testimony in a House Armed Services Subcommittee, Air Force Lieutenant General Michael Schmidt detailed how Lockheed Martin and other companies are failing to provide a, quote, couple of components needed for F-35 crews to install an upgrade called TR-3. There were 52 airplanes that contractually, uh, if TR-3 was fully ready, would have been delivered by the end of, by the end of December. Um, 21 of those airplanes are, let's say, crossed a, the last stage in the production line. Uh, the, the rest of the airplanes uh, are, are being held in general for moving TR3 hardware around. The upgrade is essentially a bigger, faster computer processor than is currently installed. Finally, brace yourself for a dose of some very good boys. It's picture day for the canine officers at an unnamed Air Force security police shop. Posted by the Instagram account, dogs are important and set to the George Clinton classic, Atomic Dog, we get a look from behind the scenes as well as their official portraits. Some very good boys indeed. All right, time for the debrief. And this week, we really have something special. Dr. Peter Brooks is basically a real life Tom Clancy character. He was a naval officer, a spy. He worked directly for the Secretary of Defense. The dude knows his stuff. Now he's semi-retired, but still writes for the Geopolitical Intelligence Services, or GIS. I had the chance recently to talk with Dr. Brooks over Zoom about a paper he authored focusing on Iran's nuclear program and just how soon it might be before they have a nuclear weapon. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. You are a hard man to get a hold of, but I really want to talk to you about an article you had written for GIS 
about Iran's nuclear ambition. And you had some kind of key takeaways in there, but I want to start off with this idea of breakout time. Can you kind of explain for our viewers um, what exactly you mean by breakout time? Well, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I, I think that that term is often used uh, inappropriately. People use it a lot. What it really means is the time it would take a country to produce enough fissile material for one bomb. Um, so it's not the time it would take for them to produce the bomb itself, but the time to produce the fissile material. The building of a bomb itself is a whole nother uh, scientific and engineering challenge. Okay. And right now, Iran's breakout time to, to get that fissile material is pretty short. Yes. Under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action from 2015, the agreement with the P5 plus one, the five permanent nuclear powers uh, plus Germany slash EU and Iran, uh, it was it was real quick. The Iran nuclear deal, as it's common. Yes. OK. Yes, exactly. The Iran nuclear deal, as it's commonly called. Uh, they envisioned that it would take a, at that point. Now, that remember, that's, uh, you know, 2015. <laughs> that's a long time ago that they envisioned that it would take a year for Iran to be able to produce enough fissile material for one bomb. Recently, the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, which it monitors, I mean, that's the UN's nuclear watchdog, which monitors this agreement, um, says that it could only be a couple of weeks, that Iran could have has enough stockpiled low enriched uranium that it, in a couple of weeks it could produce enough high enriched uranium um, to produce a couple of, uh, you know, to, to, to produce at least one bomb. Nuclear armed Iran, not good for the Middle East, not good for the world. No, not at all. I mean, we don't want to see this. We don't want to see another country join the once exclusive nuclear club. There's a lot of reasons to be concerned about Iran. They want they want hegemony over the Persian Gulf. They want they want hegemony in the in the Middle East. Um, they have serious issues with the United States and, and Israel, as we know. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of animus towards the United States and Israel. Um, they also they also are a, a radical regime that supports terrorism. Right. And one of the big concerns is, and as we've talked about this in the context, you and I haven't talked about it, but analysts have talked about this in the context of Russia, Ukraine, is Russia has nuclear weapons and Ukraine doesn't. And Russia may have more freedom of action because of concerns of escalation from the conventional scale to, to the nuclear scale. So a, a radical Islamist regime that supports terrorism with nuclear weapons and has great power aspirations is in my estimation is not a good thing. So we do not, nobody wants it. Well, the, it, many people do not want Iran to get the bomb. I'm not sure who does, although they do have some relationships with some other uh, sort of rogue states, but I, certainly the United States does not want to see uh, Iran get the, the, the bomb. Does Iran need to use ICBM or missile to be able to deliver a nuclear device if they have these terrorist proxies that could, you know, dirty bomb, you know, backpack nuke kind of thing. Right. Well, first of all, it's important to note that we're not quite clear as to whether Ron has the technology or capability to build the bomb. OK, they're working on the material that's required. And then there's a whole other set of scientific and engineering challenges that are required to actually make that warhead. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so even if they had an underground test, which they've tested nothing so far, um, you, you know, and they might try to use supercomputers to say we have the capability of doing it. We're not sure that they actually have a warhead. OK, gotcha. so then once you once you do this thing underground, you do this testing underground, then you have to miniaturize mm -hmm. that engineering rig to be able to put it in the, the, the uh, nose cone of a missile or something else. So you're talking about miniaturization. Uh, a, a back a nuke backpack is something that was talked about during the Cold War. That takes a tremendous amount of science and technology. You know, just getting it down to fit in the nose cone of an ICBM, which can carry a lot of weight, is a real challenge. A dirty bomb is not a nuclear weapon per se. It, there's no, uh, you know, fission or fusion in that. It just spreads radioactive material. So it's important to, to clarify those things. But yes, I mean, ultimately, Iran down the road could certainly, you know, put a nuclear weapon in a, in a ship and sail right. it into a harbor. Right. Uh, they could they could put it on an aircraft. Remember, that's how you know they started with with us was with aircraft. They could put it on a they could put it on a missile at some point, a different size range. Once they're able to create that sort of a warhead, they also could put it on a drone yeah. or a cruise missile. 
Um, so, and remember, Iran is a major supplier of drones and a major leading drone uh, power in the world today. And they're providing them, as we know, to Russia. Yes, um, and they're used for both ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, as well as weapons delivery. So there's all sorts of ways you could, you could do this. And yes, that's obviously a concern. Right now, there's a concern that Iran is sharing its weaponry with its, its uh, allies and proxies. Uh, in the Middle East, and some of them are terrorist groups. So, yeah. yes, you know, some people, you know, Iran is, is the most active supporter of state terrorism in the world, and them having the bomb uh, should give us a significant pause, especially the people that they uh, that they work with. So, back in November, when the GIS article came out, you had you had kind of ended it with "There's a sliver of hope that maybe Iran, <laughs> maybe Iran comes to its senses and backs off." In the month, two months since the article came out to now, do you still hold on to that small sliver of hope or is it is it gone? It's it's even smaller. <laughs> uh, I was trying to say, look, you know, we have a regime in Iran right now uh, that is led by a particular leader. And there are a lot of hardliners and Iran is a hardline regime, but there could be a change. Right. I mean, it's always possible. We're always surprised by these sort of things. Think about all the color revolutions and things along that line. So Iran, if it had a change in leadership, I could see it moving. Of course, once again, it's important to point out that Iran says that their nuclear program is for peaceful energy purposes. OK, so they're, they're saying and they're saying Islam would not allow the creation of a nuclear weapon. But I mean, you know, it's one of these things. What, are you going to believe them or are you going to believe your own eyes, mm -hmm. you know, because of what we're seeing? But once again, there's also the dr drama involved in a geopolitical maneuvering that's involved where they're trying to get leverage. OK, so the perception of a bomb program also gives you leverage. OK, and when we know we don't, there's a lot of things we don't know about the about the Iranian program. So, yes, there's always a chance that they could say, OK, this is a bad idea. We want to be integrated in the international system. We want all of the all of these uh, sanctions to go away. But. The challenges that are going on in the Middle East and the possible for a wider conflagration uh, there, um, I, I don't think Iran's going to move in that direction right now. Once again, like I said, this is a possibility, OK, yeah. and not, not a big one. And it's probably smaller now. Uh, but Iran. But that's a choice for Iran to make. There's been uh, countries have continually opened the door to Iran if they were to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but they've they've chosen not to, and they've stayed the same same course. And there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about Iran besides the nuclear weapons. I mean, it's their you know support of terrorism. We talked about you know the human rights situation in the country, um, things along that line. And other things people say, why is Iran pursuing you know nuclear weapon or nuclear energy when they have all that gas and and uh, oil? And oil? Yeah. So it's it's very expensive if you were to think about it in that in that sort of thing. And for a country that is terribly economically mismanaged and should do quite well considering its thing. It's, it's rather impoverished. Yeah. Peter, let's leave it there for now. I'm sure in a couple of months, we'll probably be circling back and uh, figuring out uh, the latest Iran steps, but thank you so much for your time okay. today. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a great one. You too. Take care. If you want to hear more of my conversation with Dr. Peter Brooks, you are in luck. We have some audio exclusives over at our podcast channels, so find that wherever you get your Weapons and Warfare podcast. I'm not sure what it is about these two, but they must provide each other some serious motivation. In December, we reported on the Roadrunner from Anduril, now here comes Raytheon's Coyote and it's our weapon of the week. Truth be told, the Coyote's been here a while. The first generation were introduced in 2014, but with age comes refinement. And while its look changed over the years, the Coyote's mission, like its cartoon counterpart, remains the same. See drone, kill drone. Public contracts show the Army wants to buy 6,000 of the Block II variants and 700 of the Block 3 variants. What's the difference? Well, Block 2s go boom, aka kinetic. Block 3s do not, aka non-kinetic. So let's break it down a little further, starting with the Block 2s. In the simplest possible terms, Block 2s are brawlers. When they lock onto a target, they throw a punch. 
And if the lessons learned during Russia's invasion of Ukraine have taught us anything about drone warfare, it's that sometimes a good punch is what you need. But why throw a haymaker when a jab will do? So while even cheap, off-the-shelf drones have to be dealt with, oftentimes that means using expensive surface-to-air missiles that could cost a million dollars a pop, much more than the device they're eliminating. According to multiple reports, the unit price for a Coyote is around $100,000, making it a bargain by comparison. When launched, the Block 2 uses a radar seeker to hone in on its target, and when it's close enough to land a hit, boom goes the dynamite, hopefully knocking its target out of the sky. So if Block 2s are brawlers, Block 3s are tacticians. There isn't a whole lot known about the technical specs just yet, but the non-kinetic descriptor is a good indication we're dealing with a system using electronic warfare countermeasures. The Army also says Block 3s can engage multiple targets at the same time, another EW indicator. One other notable difference between the two versions, the Block 2 is a one-and-done weapon, while the Block 3 can be recovered and eventually reused. Both versions of the Coyote are fairly mobile. They can be fired from ground vehicles, helicopters, surface vessels at sea, and from a fixed position, of course. When it comes to hitting the road, the Army uses the current Coyote system mounted to a mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicle, otherwise known as the Oshkosh MATV. Of course, it wouldn't be a military purchase if there weren't a few add-ons involved, so the Army is also picking up 252 fixed launchers, 52 mobile launchers, 118 fixed radars, and 33 mobile radars with the contract for the Coyotes. All right, folks, uh, it's time in the show called Comms Check. It's our opportunity to kind of uh, see where your head's at. We peruse our social media channels, find a comment or a question of yours, or it's an opportunity for us to kind of update you on a story that we have done previously. So let's get started. The first Comms Check this week comes to us on a story that we had done back in November uh, for Straight Arrow on the Ukrainian claim of having a uh, the world's new world record for the longest sniper shot at 3,800 meters. It's about 2.3 miles. Uh, and that leads us into the comment coming from Speed Demon here. Why can't we use units of 5,280 feet instead of this meter crap? Well, Speed Demon, it's kind of a two-fold question there. Firstly, uh, snipers, they use scopes, and the most common type of scope, the mill scope, uh, is based on meters. It's based on the metric system. It was created back, uh, this t style of scope was created back in the 1800s or so for artillery units um, when they're targeting in things, you know, at great distance. Um, and when they zero in their targets, uh, basically when, when you adjust your scope, you know, one click one to the left, one click to the right, um, usually that click aligns to a tenth of a meter at a distance, uh, you know, 100 meters. So one click, it'll drop a tenth of a meter after 100 meters. Um, that's basically the, the general idea of it. So that's why most snipers use meters. Uh, there are some scopes out there that um, are based on yardage, but they're just not as common. Why does America use the, uh, you know, the imperialist system and, and not the metric system? Well, it goes back, um, there's actually only three countries, the US, Myanmar, and Liberia, I believe is the third country that is not on the metric system. Every other country in the world is. But the US does use some metric uh, system stuff and some of our sports. And, you know, when, when we're talking about uh, liters of soda, um, you know, that sort of thing, there is some metric involved. But to your point, Speed Demon, um, most of the world does use the metric system. Snipers use it because it's the most common way that sniper scopes are, are, cre are created. And um, it's just an easier way to target, um, you know, a meter is a more accurate, um, uh, you know, you can get more accurate if you're using meters than say a tenth of a mile. I'm within one meter of the target sounds a whole lot better than I'm within a tenth of a mile of the target. So, hopes that answers your question, Speed Demon. Moving on now to our second comps check. And there actually is no question this week, so I'm gonna throw away my notes and we are going to answer give you an update really on a situation in Guyana. So we d had done a story, gained a lot of traction on our TikTok channel um, about Venezuela's reform uh, to annex part of Guyana as its own. 
that part of Guyana is known as Essequibo or Essequibo or Esquibo. There's multiple pronunciations. I found multiple pronunciations on it. Um, so if you're from that area and I'm saying it incorrectly, I apologize. However, good news to report is Venezuela and Guyana came out with a joint statement that said neither country will threaten or use force against one another in any circumstances or will refrain, whether by words or deeds, from escalating any conflict or disagreement. So, good news, Venezuela said they were going to take part of Guyana. The world said no. Guyana said no. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K., you know, put some military might in the area. Venezuela's backing down, and now everybody's friends again. So, good news, Venezuela, uh, you know, backed off of its, uh, its push to annex part of Guyana and is now allowing cooler heads to reform. Certainly uh, good news for everyone involved. The world could absolutely use more of that. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. Okay, folks, we're nearing the end of the show, which means it's time for Ryan's rap. On tap for the rap, the Houthis in Yemen and the decision in Washington to redesignate the terrorist organization as a terrorist organization. Quick little backstory on the Houthis, or Houthis, depending on how you want to say it. They are 100% backed by Iran. They came to power in Yemen in 2014 when they overthrew the internationally recognized government there. The Houthis were officially labeled a terrorist organization in 2021 as one of the last acts in office by then-President Donald Trump. Now, there was a lot of pressure from the UN and some other international aid organizations on Trump to not label the Houthis as terrorists. The thinking was, if the Houthis received the label, humanitarian aid into Yemen would drop and innocent people would be further victimized. Say what you want about his politics and some of his other decisions while in office, but in this regard, President Trump was right. Groups designated by the U.S. as foreign terrorist organizations, FTOs, need to meet three basic requirements. They need to be foreign. Check. They need to engage in terrorist acts or retain the capability and intent to do so. Check. And the group's terrorist activity needs to threaten U.S. national security. Another check, so the Houthis definitely meet the U.S. definition of an FTO. But President Biden delisted the Houthis as terrorists a few weeks into office. The hope was the move would lead to a diplomatic resolution with the group. But that was clearly a miscalculation. The Houthis are responsible for dozens of attacks against civilian and U.S. naval ships in the Red Sea. They've also attacked people on land, and those attacks did not start once the war in Gaza broke out, but pretty much the entire time the Houthis have been in power. In fact, back in 2021, a week after Biden said that the Houthis were not terrorists anymore, the Houthis attacked civilians. So obviously, they still met the definition of a foreign terrorist organization and never should have been delisted in the first place. Listen, I grew up with the idea leaders don't beat around the bush and instead call it like they see it. And leaders don't let bullies pick on the weak. By relisting the Houthis as terrorists, the White House is at least using the right terminology again. But they're still letting bullies ply their trade. And that's where we're going to have to leave it for this week, folks. If you have a question or a comment about anything you heard or saw on the show, please reach out to our social media channels. We would certainly love to hear from you. In the meantime, for senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I am Ryan Robertson with Weapons and Warfare, signing off. Ooh.